Javier Millet is now just over 100 days into his presidency and also into one of the world's most dramatic economic experiments. Inspired by his free market heroes like Milton Friedman, after whom he's named one of his dogs, Millet has devalued the peso and taken a chainsaw to government spending. And there have been signs of progress for this self-styled anarcho-capitalist. The official peso is closer to its black market value, inflation is down to 13% a month, and voters are supporting Millet for now. But Argentina has been home to countless full storms for 100 years. The first time I came here to the Casa Rosada was back in the 1990s to interview Carlos Menem, another reforming president who had managed to bring down inflation. He also had magnificent sideburns. That false dawn ended in riots and default in 2001. In this interview, we went through all the challenges Millet faces. Inflation, foreign policy, debt, China, as well as his relationships with Donald Trump and Elon Musk. But I began by asking him about the currency. President Millet, thank you for talking to Bloomberg. Uh, we will find time to discuss plenty of things, inflation, foreign policy, debt, and whether you get to wield your chainsaw. But let's begin with the currency. On the campaign, you talked about taking up dollarization, getting rid of the central bank, exchanging the peso for the dollar. Now you're in power. You said you will wait until after the uh, midterm elections in October 2025. But you do want to lift currency controls. And you have narrowed the gap between the unofficial rate and the parallel rate. So I wondered, will we get a proper free-floating exchange rate this year? So, first of all, the ultimate goal of doing away with a central bank still stands. The discussion regarding the central bank is primarily moral in nature and to me stealing is wrong and what the central bank does when it prints money is actually counterfeit it's fraud so from that point of view that long-term goal remains that goal remains unchanged the point is there is also the technical discussion as to what it means to be dollarized. And we have, strictly speaking, always referred to a currency competition. And then there's the implementation issue. The thing is, we inherited a bankrupt central bank. Net foreign currency reserves were negative. $11.5 billion minus. Not only did we have that problem, but also we had the equivalent of three monetary bases in interest-bearing liabilities, which were or, or had one-day maturities. And also, when December started, inflation was traveling at 3,700 a year. That was the first week in December. It then went up to 7,500 annually, and December ended with wholesale inflation at 54%, which, if annualized, amounts to 17,000%, which means that Argentina was facing a runaway monetary situation. In order to give an idea of magnitude, Argentina was facing 17% uh, of GDP in twin um, fiscal de uh, deficit. Uh, five was the Treasury, 10 the Central Bank. Argentina had a fiscal, monetary, and a currency disaster of extravagant proportions. And that required, first of all, that we clean up the balance sheets of the Central Bank. We had a strategy with a view to dollarization, which was basically about taking the liabilities of the, the, the assets, rather, of the central bank vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, federal government. In fact, the top uh, creditor 
of the uh, Argentine uh, system is the central bank. The idea was to take those securities to the market and then to basically be able to get dollars by selling off these securities. And that strategy would have worked perfectly because when we took office, Argentine securities were around $18 and now they're around $54. So it would have been a highly successful approach and we would have been in a position to do that. But given the structure of Argentina's political system and considering how intellectually dishonest politicians and economists are in Argentina, it's very likely that if we had actually engaged in that sort of transaction at market prices, of course, would have been at fair value. Politics would have probably said that was fraud because the securities, which at the time were worth 18 and now are worth 54, they would have probably accused us of some monkey uh, shady business and would have sent us to prison. So it's not that it wouldn't have been feasible to do that in technical terms, but we did infer that in political terms, politics was going to play dirty, which is what it actually does. Consider this. It's not that politics does not accompany us or support us. It tries to block us all the time. So that kind of maneuver would have been something that the opposition, with all of its intellectual dishonesty, they would have tried to pursue impeachment and uh, it would be a different story now. So faced with this scenario, we undertook an unprecedented fiscal adjustment in the history of humanity. We basically undertook an adjustment in the Treasury amount to 6% of GDP, and this we did during our first month in office, and not just that. After the deficit we had at the central bank, which was 10% of GDP, we brought it down to 4. So that we adju the adjustment we have carried out is 12% of GDP in three months' time. This is unprecedented uh, in history, and you can check this uh, with the IMF officials. There's no historical precedent of anything like this ever before. And this not only averted in hyperinflation, but also inflation has been decreasing systematically. In December, consumer inflation was 25%. In January, 20 In February, it was 13%. And if you remove the uh, transient factors like... But, but Mr. Mr. President, you've, you, yeah, I completely agree you have, you've done a lot to change the fiscal position, but the question I asked you was, are we going to move to a floating rate currency this year, which you are, you, that was the precise well, no. question. Well, in fact, you do have a uh, floating exchange rate, which is the parallel exchange rate, it's free, and the gap relative to the official rate corrected for the país uh, tax, uh, the gap is zero. And yes. we do have a free exchange rate which matches the uh, market exchange rate. What we do every day is lift restrictions on the currency market. And in fact, we are going to um, finally clean up the central bank balance sheets and get rid of the uh, interest-bearing liabilities. And once we're done with the financial reform, which is very important, we will be sending a bill that forbids issuing money. And if mm, money is issued, the uh, president of the central bank would go to jail, the board of the central bank, the president, the economy minister, and the members of Congress and senators that approve budgets with a deficit. And the, uh, in order mm, for the amount of money not to change, you need three conditions. You need to stop the three issuing mechanisms through the external sector, you buy no more dollars, the exchange rate will be flexible. The second point is you don't want to finance fiscal deficit. You need to have well-balanced public accounts. And the third element is you need to have an anti-bank run system so that there are no, there's no re-discounting. So first, you need to reform the financial system, which is what we are working on. And in that context, 
it's not just that the exchange rate is flexible, but also the money amount never varies. And as the economy recovers and grows and the money demand increases, as the amount of pesos will already be given, endogenously will have a dollarization process relating to the monetization performed by individuals in the economy. What, and I know that you are doing this thing with the floating exchange rate where you've been deprecating or depreciating the official rate by 2% each month. And the IMF and various people have said, you know, you must speed up, you must go quicker. Um, will you proceed? I know you are doing these other things, but will you speed up um, that rate of depreciation? No, because it makes no sense. It makes no sense to do that. And this is also something that some local economists say, and they are wrong. The first question is, why should I make the exchange rate take a jump today if the parallel exchange rate, the free exchange rate today, matches the official rate? It's stupid to have to make the exchange rate jump when, in fact, the exchange rate is aligned with the market rate. So that's the first thing. They should be more respectful of the decisions of individuals rather than be so arrogant, as Hayek says, uh, fatal arrogance. Because underlying this, there is a fatal arrogance issue, which has to do with thinking that you know what the real balance exchange rate is. I think, Hayek, I think Hayek was a fan of floating exchange rates. He believed in, in letting things free, and you are not doing that at the moment. Well, what he proposes is currency competition, right? Yes. It's not fully free. We are moving towards that. We're on the way. We found a mountain of regulations, and we are removing a whole lot of regulations every day. But the other important thing is that, in addition, the, f the dollar futures curve is mapped vis-a-vis -vis the monetary policy proposed by the central bank. So the question is, why should I modify the uh, exchange policy if both the present as well as future exchange rate are aligned with the central bank's uh, monetary policy. I think economists find it hard to shed some mental models that they carry in their heads. And as we say, they just don't get it. So I think I can read from that that it's unlikely to go to what outsiders would see as a fully floating rate till maybe next year or after that. As soon as we finally clean up the balance sheets of the central bank and complete the uh, financial reform, we'll automatically move to a fully free uh, exchange rate. The thing is, when you do that through market mechanisms, that will be decided by individuals who want to get the instruments that you use for these changes. So you can't define time, because if you define time, it means that you are doing this forcibly. And as this depends on the will of individuals, we need for individuals to uh, switch the portfolios towards a new structure that will uh, allow for the uh, central bank no longer to have these interest-bearing liabilities. This is something that can't be known unless you do it forcibly. But many people find it hard to think in yes. terms of freedom. On the su subject of freedom, you came out, came in, you talked about taking a, a chainsaw to the bloated Argentine state, and as you've already said, you managed to achieve these fiscal surpluses in January and February. Well, that's well done, and you, you did that in part by, by changing the pensions and things like that. But Everyone would say, in the end, you have to tackle government jobs and subsidies. And yes, you've begun to tackle 70,000 government jobs are going. But my question for you is, when are you going to deal with subsidies? I, at the moment, energy and transport, these are areas where Argentines get a fantastic deal from the state. If I use the subway here, the cost, I think, is 50, 125 pesos, or 10 cents. When all the people you admire, Milton Friedman, Hayek, etc., they would say the real cost of that is around 750 pesos. So when are you going to change the subsidy system so that people pay what they're supposed to? 
So when you work on these regulated services, there is one key element, which is when you recalibrate rates. Traditionally, many analysts clumsily recalibrated the financial economic equation of contracts consistent with the capital base, essentially by uploading all of the price uh, upfront at the beginning, which is not necessarily right because this is an intertemporal equation and therefore you can work on the different components in the financial and economic equation of the contract, which is basically the uh, flow of funds rewritten otherwise. Yeah. And you seek the price that uh, makes the IRR equal to the uh, weighted average cost of capital, which means that there's hardly um, the no, no quasi-rent. This creates a competitive balance. And in that context, you can fix uh, rate pathways. Now, one important thing that, of course, you can do right away or mm, spread that over time. If we were to do that clumsily, as some recommend, all of that upfront, the problem is that that will be stopped by the Supreme Court, which is what the Supreme Court did with the government of Macri. So what we have done is include as a restriction the Supreme Court decision. So we ended up rebuilding uh, or reconstituting the financial economic equation of a contract over a three-year term. And what you can see is that there are increases in rates, but the rates include different components, among which is salaries or wages, because when Argentina uh, manages to turn the corner and recover salaries, it'll be a lot easier to rebuild rates without that being a problem for individuals who will be able to pay for them. Because, of course, you can take care of the rates, but if the uh, demand doesn't follow suit because no one can pay for that, the problem is even greater. So we are going to do that, but we're going to do that in such a way that the Supreme Court will not hold this. So the idea is over a three-year term. It's quite interesting you, you, you bring up the Supreme Court. When I've spoken to people here, they say your, your biggest obstacle at the moment is politics. Because, as you said, the Congress is not controlled by you. You only have 14% of the seats in Congress. I remember coming here to interfere with Senor Menem. Carlos Menem had a, had a majority in Congress. He could push through um, reforms. And you, you failed to get your omnibus bill through the first time. And now you are talking to the governors about a plan to reduce the state spending from 37% of GDP to 22%. That would be a, a very big deal. And there are 24, 23 governors uh, in, in Argentina and the, the, the mayor of Buenos Aires. So my, my simple question to you, how many have said that they will sign the deal with you on May the 25th? Because that seems a crucial part of what you want to achieve now. We should separate the short-term issues from the long-term issues. So those that have to do with the particular situation in the here now, what is structural in nature? Both the emergency decree, which still stands, as well as the so-called omnibus bill, which we are reformulating and will be resending to Congress, and also the uh, May 25th agreement, well, those are instruments that have to do with the long-term dynamics. So whether they do come out or not, they will not affect the short-term dynamic, which is dominated by fiscal adjustment, the cleaning up of the central bank, liberalizing the uh, currency market, the exchange market and the financial reform that we can pursue through the central bank and the decisions that will bring down inflation and help economic activity recover. In fact, there are already indicators today that show that activity in the agricultural sector, in the oil and gas sector, in mining, well, the economy is recovering strongly. 
in those departments. There are indicators that point to the fact that Argentina could really make a strong comeback. And if we can also rebuild the uh, demand for money and bring down even faster the issue of the interest-bearing liabilities, the lifting of exchange restrictions will be much closer, and the economy will speed up its expansion rate much faster. And as Argentina's economy has been decapitalized after 20 years of savage populism, this means that we will be able to achieve genuine growth even without the reforms. So by 2025, we'll be able to have a very low inflation rate with an ex economy expanding very significantly, which would allow us to have truly impressive election results that would allow us to have a Congress that would support these reforms. And one more thing, on December 11th, 2025, not only will I be sending the uh, reforms that they won't let me push through now, because we are talking about 10,000 reforms, the most ambitious program in the history of humanity, and I'll be sending the remaining 3,000. We are going to transform Argentina's economy with the first 1,000 structural reforms we have sent. In terms of economic freedom, Argentina would have become a country like Germany, and we would have joined that path, which would have allowed us to become an economy similar to that of Germany in 20 years' time. But that's not my final objective. My ultimate goal is to have economic uh, freedom levels like uh, those of Ireland and be a country that can have a uh, GDP um, f f 50 percent higher than that of the states. And any reforms that I can't push through today, I will push through after December 2025 and the remain 3,000. So, after, so really the, the biggest reforms could come after you get a majority in the midterms? Exactly. So that politics won't be able to block the structural reforms. And this is very important. There's two dimensions to it. If we talk about the emergency decree, it's the very first time this was rejected. Even though we had cases in the past where the uh, decrees uh, curtailed individual freedoms and uh, undermined private property and other horrible things, both the emergency decree and the omnibus uh, bill are instruments that give more freedom to citizens, make the market structures more competitive and pro-market, and this also does away with political thieving, which is very serious. Politics didn't want to stop stealing. Politics puts its own caste interests above the needs of the country. So in a democratic system, the system recycles itself, and the beauty of what politics has done with the uh, omnibus uh, law is that they have actually been exposed. Now people know what the true colors are. Now people know that trust funds are used uh, for stealing and senators who voted against have been exposed in the face of sight. I think that's great because if I had said beforehand that when uh, I was two months in office we would be able to coordinate the whole political spectrum and uh, have an ideological separation, you would have told it was impossible, and still we're doing that. And they also told me it would be impossible to pursue an adjustment like the one we are pursuing. We actually uh, got to 6% um, and 6% in the central bank. And while some uh, start brooding and saying that things are impossible, I just do them. Matt, can I ask you about inflation? Because it strikes me, yes, you are in a position where you, your politics, you may have to wait to 2025, but you have this issue with inflation that it went up to 26%, as you said, and now it's down to 13% a month. One issue for you is that if you do things like release capital controls, if you get rid of those subsidies, then inflation may go up in the short term. Quite, you may be doing the right thing in the long term, but inflation would go up in the short term. And inflation is the thing that you have promised Argentines you will keep low. Is that the, another reason for delaying? I don't see why opening up the uh, markets 
Actually, what, what generates inflation is the fact that I haven't yet fully cleansed the central bank. That's the point. If I haven't cleaned up the balance sheets of the central bank, it means that I am not solvent. If you, if you got rid of controls, there would be a rush to get dollars, there would be inflation would go up. Everyone, I think, would say that. Well, that's not necessarily what's going on, right? But the thing is this. In order to do that, I first need to clean up the central bank balance sheets. It's important to understand this because when you've got the central bank bankrupt in a situation in which the uh, monetary liabilities exceed the assets held by the central bank, that is corrected through a higher price level so that you dilute your monetary liabilities. The more bankrupt you are, so to speak, the long-term price level is higher. Therefore, given today's price level, the link between those two prices is the implicit inflation rate. As you rebuild the solvency of the central bank, which is what we're doing, consider that the money base has remained virtually unchanged ever since we took office. But still, and despite the put options and the interest paying liabilities, what we inherited from the previous government, and after having uh, bought almost $12 billion, what we have sterilized through the purchase of the Bop Real, and uh, as regards the fiscal surplus, the money base hasn't changed. So we are cleaning up the balance sheets of the central bank, and in so doing, the long term price level shrinks because we are shrinking the nominal scale in the economy and the slope is reduced and the inflation rate comes down. This is why it is so important to clean up the balance sheets of the central bank to get rid of that pressure. Once we achieve that and are able to undertake the financial reform in order uh, for there no longer to be the possibility of uh, issuing re-discounting. The financial reform actually has to move towards a free banking system integrated with the capital markets so that there are no runs and all the imbalances are cleaned up through uh, prices. In that context, if you also have your public accounts, uh, government accounts in order and you don't use the central bank to finance deficit, and if you also lift the currency restrictions, uh, well, the uh, first thing you need to do is clean up the uh, central bank balance sheets. Once we've done that, there's the anti-issuing uh, law. One very key attribute of which is that this will make it a crime against humanity and not time-barred if you issue money. It may well be the case that once we leave office, someone may come along and want to change that. They may do that, but then someone else might come back and lock them up in prison for doing that. But the, these, these, these might all be very admirable reforms, but at the moment, if you are an, an Argentine living here at the moment, there is short-term pain in the same way as there was with Margaret Thatcher, with all the people who you admire. And I just looked at the statistics. They're quite frightening. The average salary in Argentina is at its... Lowest level since 2003, 57% of Argentines live in poverty. Consumer spending dropped 23% in February. So far, the interesting thing is your support has stayed high at 50%. But do you, do you accept that there is a time limit on how, lo how much pain Argentines can keep, can take to take these reforms? The first thing is, the way we see it, there has been a cultural change in Argentina. And most Argentines have understood that the solution is not populism. Today, wages are miserable, not through our own fault. That is due to 20 years of populism. When you take the average wage of Argentines back in the 1990s and update it to today's currency, that would be $3,000. If we round it up uh, now, 600. 
I don't, th I don't think anyone disagrees no, with no, the no, idea no, no, that no, no, Argentina... No. Ar I came here in the 1990s. No, no. It was a d it's had disasters. No, no. But you ha Pero it's your medicine. No, quiero, quiero, quiero... Entonces, si no but uh, if we don't understand what happened, it'll be hard to fix it. So all of this matter, you know, tampering with the prices in the economy, creates a mismatch between savings and investments and it makes investment go into places it shouldn't be going because the, uh, the prices are distorted and saving is punished for the benefit of consumption. So present consumption is um, given priority over future savings. So in the short term it means that you have more consumption and investment than you would have in normal circumstances because you are actually falsifying the price signals which means that the economy temporarily operates beyond its means, um, not only because it's lying as far as prices are concerned, because, but also because you're eating away at the capital in between. The longer you keep that sort of situation, when the turnaround takes place, it's a lot more violent. Argentina has been doing this for 20 years, and the the cost of this is 50% poor over 10% extreme poor. That is the consequence of having had 20 years of uh, populism. We have per capita GDP which is 15 lower than what we had in 2011. So when you look at the figures in dollars, it's hopeless. But when we took office and inherited the economy, the monetary imbalance was worse than we had prior to the crisis in 1975 called Rodrigazo. We had the central bank balance sheets bankrupt, even worse than uh, before the uh, 1989 hyperinflation. Our social indicators were worse than under President de la Rue in 2001, before the end of convertibility. It was the sum of all evils. So what we did was explain to society, to the people, what the state of affairs was and what the measures would be. And there were some matters that couldn't be fixed just like that. If inflation is traveling, at between 7,500 and 15,000 a year. Do you think there's any gradual solution to fix that? Can there be some solution like saying, okay, I can continue to issue money or keep the fiscal deficit? There's no such solution. The solution was a hyper-orthodox one, and as there was no kind of financing, it had to be shock treatment too. So you need for it to be shock treatment and nice and powerful in order to cut off and uproot all of this, because you can quote all of the indicators that may look bad in today's economy. Okay, but the alternative scenario, if we had done things like the ones done by the previous administration, would have 95% poor and 60% extreme poor today, and this would be a true mess. It would be impossible to live here. So that's the sort of world we are facing. The thing is that many fall into the nirvana fallacy. They compare things vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a world that doesn't exist. What we have done is tell people the truth. Another important thing is we don't just say what we think and do what we say we're going to do, but we said this during our campaign. This wasn't just campaign promises. I did this when we took office. And if you look at the facts, we've been 100% consistent. The solution is complex and requires very strong medicine. In the short term, we will have suffering, but after that, we will emerge. And the truth is that people are able to see this, because now 70% of people admit that they're worse off. What you described is true. But consider this. When we took office, only 20% of Argentines thought they would be better off in six months' time. In January, the percentage went up to 30. Then in February, it went up to 42. And today, it is over 50, which means that over half of the Argentine people see light at the end of the tunnel. Not just that. When you ask about inflation, 70% of Argentines are convinced that we are going to bring inflation down. There's 50% who believe we'll do this within the first year, and 20 believe we're going to do this in two years' time. But when you also 
ask around for the word that reflects the sentiment of Argentines now, you know what it is? Hope. What I find fascinating about all this is that Argentines have understood that populism is no solution and that the quick fixes they sold to them uh, during the last hundred years, both the uh, criminal politicians and criminal economists, they were all false. And we need to opt for a pure orthodox market-based solution. And that's what's going to make us uh, succeed. And that's what's uh, underway. Even though we are undertaking the largest adjustment in the history of humanity, my approval ratings are on the rise because people know that I'm telling them the truth. Can we, can we look at foreign relations? Um, last year, you called the Chinese government an assassin. Uh, now you're in government. Do you still see China that way? As for the Chinese government, what we've always said is that we are libertarians. And if people want to do business with China, they can carry on, business as usual. What I said was that I wouldn't be aligning with communists. Um, and that's precisely one of the things. Who did I say I was going to align with? The United States and Israel. Do you have any doubt that that's my alignment, United States and Israel? No, but in fact you have a very good, exam very good example at the moment, and I'll come back to Israel and the United States later, but now, as you know, in Argentina, the focus is on a Chinese space station in Patagonia that your predecessor allowed to get built. The U.S. says that the space station has military purposes. Um, will you close it down? Well, the point is this. Negotiations are beginning to uh, audit and inspect that because the Chinese say that is not the case. So we will move towards a situation. We will be looking at that. So that is not a problem either. Is a, is a factor in this the fact that you have that $18 billion currency swap line with China, which you do need? You need it for the reserves at the, at the central bank. It's a big portion. Does that, that influence your thinking on China? That situation has to do with an agreement that was entered into and which has to do with the trade exchanges between countries. I won't modify trade exchanges because I think there are trade exchanges between privates. Just as we have a part in our central bank, uh, they have, of course, their uh, central bank counterpart. I don't see a problem. And honestly, the uh, trade relations haven't changed. Not suppose, a problem. I suppose the problem would be if I was the Chinese government and, I, and, and you called me an assassin, I might be less keen to renew the currency line. Uh, have trade relations changed? They haven't, not one bit. So that is actually counterfactual. There's no truth. What about other sources of capital? Because I know you've be begun discussions again with the IMF. Your economy minister talked about it. You have a facility there of $44 billion. How much money would you like to get from the IMF and, and when do you think you would get it? It would obviously imply that they were approving of your in reforms. So they may, the IMF may be approving of our reforms and it doesn't necessarily have to be all of the money I'm after in order to uh, speed up the end of the currency restrictions for which if we wanted to accelerate that, if we wanted to do that today, we'd need $15 billion. Now, if you go over the IMF press releases, you'll see that we are facing an unusual situation. Even in the IMF system, we're only the, the only country that has exceeded all of the targets and in record time and that greatly facilitates the uh, space there is for a new program and also enhances 
well, the possibility of there being fresh funds or not also depends on the financial position of the IMF. So we are exploring different paths. Uh, one thing uh, could be for the IMF to serve as an auditor and to contribute part of the funds, and other funds could come from other countries that Argentina also um, smoothly trades with, and uh, another share could come from investment funds to make it easy. 5,000, 5,000, 5,000. Do you, are, there, are there some, you've talked before about private investment funds coming in and, and backing Argentina. Can you give us any names of, of funds which are out there that want to come here? Well, that will be known when the time comes. Uh, there wouldn't be much point in doing that today. The option of deferral has value to it. On, on, on the subject. On the, sub on the subject of foreign investors, you have Elon Musk as one of your great supporters. Is, is he going to come and invest in Argentina? Well, in fact, Starlink is already entering Argentina. And um, by way of uh, promotion, they have given 33 uh, pieces of equipment to rural schools uh, as a donation and we will soon have a meeting with Elon Musk. I have no doubt that Elon Musk will be an active player and he will have a major role in the new Argentina that is leaving behind the decadence of 100 years of populism to get on the path towards a world power again. And do, you, do you think this, this year we might be able to see Argentina returning to the public debt markets? Is that, a, is that a hope, a plan for this year at all? Well, in order to be able to go back to the debt markets would have to bring its uh, country risk levels to uh, 1,000 basic points. And today, uh, Argentina has already got past 1,400. So uh, the country risk level was around uh, 2,900 when we took office, and now it is in the 1,300 range. So if we stick to this harsh fiscal policy, we will achieve that. And let me tell you why. When we talk about zero deficit, we mean zero deficit as far as the financial line is concerned, after the payment of interest. So if financial deficit is zero, that means that debt doesn't grow. And if debt doesn't grow, the debt to GDP ratio is non-growing, so to speak. So you're solvent. So in that context, which is obviously very strict in terms of fiscal solvency, it means that you're able to repay your debt. And if you're able to repay your debt, the price of bonds goes up. This is why bonds have gone up the way they have, from 18 to $54. So they, this has increased threefold. Do you think that's a minor gain? You, you, you talked earlier about your support of Israel, and you've been an outspoken supporter of Israel. Um, I wonder, do you now support a ceasefire in Gaza? You have Joe Biden pushing for that. Well, I support the actions being undertaken by the government of Israel. Even, even including, I mean, to, you've said that before, but today, yesterday, we had the terrible tragedy of the aid workers being killed, which even Netanyahu has apologized and said, that was a mistake. Do, do you accept that Israel can do, has made some mistakes in Gaza? Again, from my point of view, the strategy being pursued by the government of Israel is the right one. And my position has always been the same. I've always said that I condemn the terrorist acts committed by terrorist group Hamas. And not just that, I also express my full solidarity vis-a-vis -vis the people of Israel. And I'm also uh, for the uh, legitimate right to self-defense. And the strategy being pursued by Israel is the right one. So I openly support the actions undertaken by Israel. Uh, well, there can be mistakes, that's life. But Israel is trying to do things within the international framework 
for dealing with these issues. So I support Israel on this. I'll ask, ask you two very quick last questions, both to do with your, 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 kind of, um, um, your ideology. The first one is you, you, know, you, you are a libertarian, you're an admirer. I mentioned Margaret Thatcher earlier. Milton Friedman, you named one of your dogs after. Um, and yet at the same time, you, you are a big supporter of Donald Trump. You know, Milton Friedman was about free trade, free markets. Donald Trump is possibly somebody who's pushed protectionism. He's someone who takes a, a warmer view of Vladimir Putin than you do. He tends to be le much less supportive of the kind of liberal economics that you do. And I wondered whether, you know, what has changed? Has liberal economics changed or, or is Trump really not that? Do you really support Donald Trump in that way? Well, first, within the libertarian uh, lines, you have subsets. You have the classic, you have the monarchists, you have the anarchists. Now, as to how to go about things in daily life, Murray Rothbard has provided some uh, good guidelines as to what political action should be uh, when it comes to a libertarian. So the first thing we need to do is um, compare vis-a-vis -vis that line. You know, um, we need to be consistent. I may strongly admire Hamilton Friedman, but my top authority is Murray Rothbard. And the the anarcho-capitalist. Exactly. It's true, one of my dogs was named after Milton Friedman, but another presumably, one is called Murray. Presumably, presumably the Milton dog barks every time you mention Trump. <laughs> Not really. Milton has a very peculiar personality. He's very keen on being around women. It's amazing. He's the one that is particularly close to the ladies. But aside from the personality of my four-legged children, because there's another two, there's uh, Robert and Lucas, right? Named after Robert and Lucas. But I also um, somehow started dropping names and they wouldn't come close. So they got the names that they liked and came close to. When I said Ludwig, none of them came close. When I said Frederick, none of them, you know, Mises and, uh, and Hayek. But aside from this acute uh, colorful detail, and, and Conan, by the way, was the, the father. Uh, of, obviously, we're talking about the barbarian warrior. The, the important thing here is this. The greatest value of Donald Trump's policy is that he has rightly identified the enemy, and the enemy is socialism. If you want to put that in terms closer to the Austrian School of Economics, we could talk about those who uh, support statism. In my uh, actually defines socialism based on different interpretations or readings. So what Huerta Soto might uh, classify as statism, uh, you know. In, in that regard, Donald Trump has rightly identified the enemy very well, with meridian clarity. And as regards trade, measures are evaluated without taking into consideration where the world was coming from. The discussion of global imbalances, which led to the subprime mortgage crisis, or the problems in U.S. monetary policy design as a result of the fact that China didn't want to uh, free up the exchange rate, and how in that context, in order to uh, correct the global imbalances, one of the things China needed to do was free up the exchange rate. And as it did, wouldn't want to do that, Trump's response was to erect trade barriers. So, you see, the, the economy and politics. You can be as pro-trade as you want, but if um, at the other end they don't play by the rules of free trade, if you want to play by the rules of capitalism and big countries, free up the exchange rate. Now, if you don't want to do that, 
then you will be met with a response. But you can't evaluate a politics in a vacuum or policies in a vacuum because that would be tantamount to not understanding the rationale of economic policy. This is like anarcho-capitalists coming along and making economic policy recommendations that when you look at that against the backdrop of the uh, constraints of the real world, it's uh, like being all dressed up and nowhere to go. So measuring uh, Trump or evaluating his uh, trade policy by that yardstick is a mistake because he acted in response. Uh, should the U.S. forego the possibility of having its monetary policy because China decides to have a fixed exchange rate policy? Would you recommend to the President of the United States that they no longer have a monetary policy? I don't think so. Can I ask you one very last question? It's a simple yes-no question. You, you, have, you have now been President for 100 days. Um, you appear to be enjoying it. But it is pretty evident that you're not going to get everything done quickly. So I suppose my question, you talked about the October, the, the elections next year. My simple question is, do you want to get re-elected? Do you want to serve another term as president? Yes or no? That depends on whether the results are favorable. So to the extent the results support us, there might be uh, a chance, uh, and if not, it'll be up to the people to decide. The people will decide. Now, if, you know, if you look at the surveys, when you ask people if there were a run of today, we would win 58 to 42. We would win with a 16-point margin. And one more thing. If this was the first round, we would get 48 percent with which we would be able to win the first round because, you know, uh, that would give us enough um, of an advantage. But we could still get even more. And even though we are pursuing the greatest monetary and fiscal adjustment in history, we would still be able to win in the first round with 53 percent of the vote. Hey, why should I change? I think I'll take that as a yes. Um, President Millet, thank you very much for talking to Bloomberg. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.